Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear The hour I first believed My chains are gone I've been set free My God, my Savior has ransomed
Just the women, just the women. to do better than that. Man, lift it up. are the days of Elijah declaring the word of the Lord and these are the days of your servant Moses' righteousness being restored and know these are days of great trials of famine and darkness and sword still we are the voice in the desert crying prepare ye the way of the lord behold he comes riding on the clouds shining like the sun at the trumpet's call lift your voice it's the year of jubilee and out of zion till salvation These are the days of Ezekiel, the dry bones becoming as flesh. These are the days of your servant David rebuilding a temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest, 
the fields are as wide as your world, and we are the laborers in your vineyard. Declare the word of the Lord. The old becomes riding on the clouds, shining like the sun at the trumpet. Jehovah, there is no God like 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 Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. The old he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet's call, lift your voice to hear our jubilee. And out of silence, his salvation comes. The old he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet.
financial burdens, Lord. There are people that need work. And you know just the job for them, Lord. You know where they need to be, God. We have families here that are torn apart. God, you can heal them. We know you have that healing power, God. We have children that need a role model, Lord. We pray that these mommies and daddies will step up and be a role model for their children. Lord, we got mommies and daddies that need a role model. We pray that these older folks and the seniors in our church will step up and be a role model and a good example for our children, us and our children's children, Lord. I pray that you'd look upon our service today. Lord, I want you to reach down this morning like you never have before. Lord, put your arms around us. Let us know that you are here in this presence in our church that we love, Lord. We love our church. But we want you to be the center of our church, Lord. I pray this morning that you would just be with those, that we would have nothing but a positive attitude, Lord. Let the negativity be gone. Take it away. I pray that you would heal our hearts, Lord, because if we ever needed you, it's now. If we ever needed you, John chapter 13, would you please? John chapter 13, it's all about the feet. Here's one thing I can claim this morning. Everybody's got feet in this place, amen? Everybody's got feet. So it's all about the feet. You're going to understand that a little bit better here in just a moment. That's some nasty feet right there. Your feet ever look that bad? Your wife's? Tony? You were a stupid man, Tony. <laughs> I apologize for him. I do. Okay, I would never say that about my wife's feet. You know, if you go to um, a lot of countries in the, in the world, if you go to a lot of Middle Eastern countries, they, they wear sandals. They don't wear usually full shoes. Uh, Indonesia, many parts of Africa... They go all day long with, with sandals on, and at the end of the day, their feet will look like that. In fact, a lot of times worse than that. Uh, we're going to be talking about feet, talking about Jesus washing some feet. So many of us are familiar with that, that story. And I was, as I was studying this week and reading, and, and I was reading a commentator, and he said, you know, he goes, so many people preach about Jesus washing the disciples' feet. And, you know, I got to thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I don't think I've ever heard a sermon about Jesus washing the disciples' feet. I don't think I ever have. I just don't think I have. So, and actually, this, this, this message was inspired by one of our senior adults in this church. I met with him this week. And he said something, and I went, I know what I'm preaching Sunday. And I got to work. Jesus washed the disciples' feet. I want you to know that when he washed the feet of those disciples, they probably looked as bad or worse than that picture you saw before this. Uh, that, in that day, uh, in the time of Jesus' life here on this earth, uh, dirt roads, stones, rocks, trash, hygiene was pretty much not understood, human waste in the streets, discarded food. You, you walk that all day. In fact, when I used to take mission teams to to other parts of the world, some of our people would wear sandals when we'd go to these third world nations, and I'd go, are you nuts? You know, wear your sandal feet. I always made sure I had some good shoes on. I didn't want my feet exposed. Well, that's what those folks walk through all the time. And our Jesus got down 
and washed the disciples' feet of that nastiness, the smell, the filth. Talk about a willing servant. My goodness. I looked and I looked and I looked to find that picture because I had the hardest time finding a picture that depicted what the Scriptures say. Because the Scriptures say that Jesus discarded his robe, his outer garment, and tied the cloth around him. And if you look at most of the pictures that are made or paintings of Jesus washing the disciples' feet, it's him with his full uh, gown on or his, his overcoat uh, type thing on. Uh, and it didn't portray And it took me forever to find this. Uh, it, it portrayed it a little bit more of what I thought accurately with the Scriptures. In fact, the feet to this day in the Middle East are really looked down on. Uh, it's considered a very filthy part of the body. Uh, you don't touch another man's feet in the Middle East. Same back in this day. Uh, and if you've watched in Libya, uh, if you've seen some of the video clips in Libya, they have you know, the statue heads of Gaddafi. And what do you see them doing? They're stepping on them with their feet. You'll see them stepping because that's such an insult to put your dirty feet on someone. Remember with President Bush in, in uh, Iraq? What that man throw at him when he was in his shoes? What a huge statement of disrespect and ugliness, taking a dirty shoe in the Middle East and throwing it at a man. If it hadn't been for the U.S. presence there, they'd have taken that man's head off. I guarantee they'd take him out the street and chop his head off for what he did. Severe insult. Now, that's been the history of, of feet. And, and, and not in the Middle East, but, but in Indonesia. When we go to Indonesia... We were told the first time we went, said, when you, first off, when you enter a meeting, you walked into the meeting, you would put your hands together and you do this as you go into the meeting and you sit down. And you would sit down. And they told us, and most of our meetings were on the floor, they said, do not let the bottoms of your feet be looking at anyone because that was a severe uh, uh, staying, uh, statement of, of disrespect to have your bottoms of your feet pointing to somebody. So when you sat down, you had to cross your legs and make sure your feet weren't pointing at anybody. That's kind of difficult to do sometimes when you sat in a circle. So that's the idea of the feet. Now, some churches today have made one of the ordinances foot washing. Here in, in the Southern Baptist denomination, the ordinances are baptism and the Lord's Supper. Some denominations include foot washing. And I've seen that done where they take a Sunday during the course of the year and everybody brings in little basins and they'll actually do a foot washing ceremony in the church. Right there amongst people. I don't think that's a bad thing. If they can keep the meaning of foot washing, then that's fine. Now, I don't have a problem with that. We just don't do that as an ordinance in, in the Southern Baptist denomination. But Jesus was telling the disciples a lesson. He was giving them a lesson. Giving them a lesson of humility, of servanthood, but also another uh, instruction, and that uh, is, and we're going to look at it in just a moment, about salvation and what Christ's death was going to mean. And we're going to look at that, but let's look at the text. Go to John 13. We're going to read verses 1 through 20. 13, 1 through 20. And by the way, this is... This is Jesus' last night with the disciples. We call this the upper room discourse. Just hours away from death. Giving instructions to his disciples. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from the supper, laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured the water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel with which he was girded. So he came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I do you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. Stop just a moment. 
Jesus is saying to Peter, Peter, you don't get this exactly. They're going to get the idea of the humility and the servanthood pretty quickly. But this part of, of the salvation aspect, it's not going to all come together until the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. Then it's really going to sink in what Jesus was teaching here as a second level of teaching. He says in verse 8, Peter said to him, or Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If you do not, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, But he who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. Now let me stop you there just a moment and explain that. Again, Jesus is teaching about salvation. He's saying, listen, when you receive me after my death, you'll be saved. I mean, it's a done deal. You are bathed, totally cleansed. And then he says, after you've done that, then all you need is to have your feet washed. What he was saying was this. You've been bathed when you say yes to Christ and you say, you're totally bathed. It's done. But through the course of the day, our feet get dirty, don't they? We sin. Oh, we're we're going to sin today. I, very few people that I, I can't imagine anybody not sinning by the end of this day. Some of you in the restaurant today, you're going you're gonna to say something ugly when your food comes out cold in the restaurant. You're going to sin. Some of the mothers and the wives, they're going to go home and they're going to be mad because they got to cook. They're going to sin. All of us are probably going to have dirty feet by the end of the day. Jesus says, you know what? When you said yes to Christ, you're saved. It's a done deal. But your feet get dirty. You sin every day. And you need to have your, wash, your feet washed. You need to confess sin. Confess your sin. Get it right. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason he said, not all of you are clean. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined to the table again, he said to them, do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you ought also to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also could do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is the one who was sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I do not speak, I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen, that is, what the scripture may, that the Scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. From now on, I am telling you before it comes to pass, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. It's all about the feet. Now, let's just talk just a moment about being a servant, because Jesus is teaching about servanthood. He's not teaching the disciples to be nice. Hear me, he's not teaching the disciples to be nice. He's not saying, now guys, I want you to be nice to each other. That's not what he's teaching. He's teaching them servanthood. In other words, he's saying, guys, you've got to learn to give up your rights. You've got to learn to give up your privileges. It's not about who you are or what you think you are. It's about the other guy. It's about servanthood. Giving up your preferences, giving up your rights for the one being served. In other words, the guy beside you, that disciple beside you is more important than you are. He's teaching that along with his salvation. Now, how does somebody get that kind of servant attitude? Hello. It's hard, isn't it? You're asking me to give up my privileges and my rights. You're asking a lot. You're asking me to give up my earthly agenda. You're asking a lot. How in the world do we get that kind of servant mentality? Humility. Humility. I think one of the hardest things for a Christian to get his hands on is this word, humility. Thinking not less of yourself, but less about yourself. Humility. That's how it happens. 
a heart change, a mind change. I'm going to talk about that this morning. I want to talk about three points. I'm going to give them to you very quickly. Number one, the urgency of foot washing. Number two, the humility of foot washing. Number three, the blessings of foot washing. Number one, the urgency of foot washing. Now look again at verses one through three, would you please? During the supper, verse 2, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that he had come forth from God and was going back to God. Jesus knew he was going back home. He knew. There was an urgency to Jesus right now. He's in this upper room discourse. He's saying, I've got a little bit of time. I've got to give instructions to my disciples. Could you imagine? Could you imagine if somebody told you, you know what, uh, Eric, you've got three hours to live, and you're a goner. You go to your doctor, you say, Eric, I've just found something in your heart. You've got three hours, and you're a goner. I'm going to tell you what I would do. First thing I would go home is I'd say, baby, sit down my wife. The life insurance is here and here. You need to go talk to someone. I mean, I would. Wouldn't you do this? I'd say, honey, I need you to make sure that you go to Tom. Take care of the life insurance. That's here. Now, the savings, if you'll just go ahead and work with Tom, he'll, he'll help you with the finances and take care of that. Then I'd probably call my mom and say, Mom and Dad, I love you. Not going to be here long. Take care of my wife. Take care of my kids. Help. And, and you'd, be, you, you'd be tying some ends up, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? That, that's what I'd be doing. And Jesus is tying up ends. He's going, I've got a few hours with my disciples. I've, there's an urgency in what I've got to get done. And Jesus is doing that in this upper room discourse. There was an urgency. How many people were in the upper room with Jesus? How many? Twelve disciples, right? And? And? Jesus, so that makes 12 plus 1, 13. There was 14. There was 14. Satan. He was there. How do we know? Because the scripture tells us that he was already putting into, into Judas' heart to betray him. Satan was in the upper room. There was an urgency. Jesus knew that when he left this earth, the mission must continue. He also knew that Satan was alive and well, working to divide the disciples. Even now, he had already penetrated the heart of Judas. Jesus is saying, get ready. He's going to continue to attack. One of the greatest ways for Satan to attack the body of believers, the church is lack of humility and division through non-servanthood in the body of Christ. Jesus knew. There was an urgency. He's seen Satan work. He knew what Satan was up to. He knew the attacks. He knew the perils. Jesus even said, in the scripture, he said, a house divided by its divided cannot what? Stand. There's an urgency in the church. Satan wants to divide the church. It's a great way to ruin the work. Divide member against member. Age group against age group. Music liking against another type of music liking and and, and culture against culture, and race against race. And we could go on and on and on. Satan is alive and well in the life of the church and seeks to divide. And Jesus knew that his greatest attack would come through the lack of humility within the congregation. Do you believe that? I hope you do. East Hill. It's good to see all of you here, by the way. It's a good crowd, isn't it? Isn't this exciting? I like this. I like this. Satan doesn't. He doesn't. He's a toothless dog. He's a thief and a destroyer, a murderer. 
He can't stand this this morning. The urgency of foot washing. Number two, the humility of foot washing. Mm -mm -mm. Look at verse 13 through 15 again, please. You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then the Lord and the teacher washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should also do as I did to you. The humility of foot washing. You know, the only ones that washed feet in this time of the life of Jesus, if you were a wealthy person and you had a servant, guess who got to wash the people's feet? The servant. Nasty job. If you weren't rich enough to have a servant, then you washed your own stinking feet. Your wife wouldn't wash your feet. And your husband wouldn't wash your feet. And you probably couldn't pay your kids enough allowance to wash your nasty feet. <laughs> it was just a nasty job. But you know, Jesus, he gets down on his knees. First off, think about what he did. You saw that picture. Just the, the, the cloth, the cloth that he wiped their feet with was girded around him. I'm going to propose it wasn't that much cloth. And that same piece of cloth he used to wipe the feet. Now that means that when he wiped their feet, he wasn't doing this. He was down here, face in their feet with the stench, the nastiness, and he's unclothed. That was not a common practice in that day for a man to be just exposed or be exposed from his waist up, especially a man of the, of the credentials of Jesus Christ. And he's there washing those feet, holding that cloth there, doing that, and the smell, the dirt, showing humility, servanthood. The example of humility. You know, Jesus initiated this greater going to the lesser. The greater going to the lesser. When it comes to humility in the life of the church amongst the brothers and the sisters, you know what? It doesn't matter if you're older or if you're younger. Whether you're older, whether you're younger, it's humble service. Humility. If it's black to the white or white to a, a, a person of color or a person of color to white, it doesn't matter. It's, it's service and humility. If it's male to female, female to male, it, it doesn't matter what the sex, it's service and humility. It doesn't matter that, that you are the president of the bank in town and the person who works at Kmart it doesn't matter. It's, it's again, it's Kmart person to the banker, the banker to the Kmart person, service and humility. It doesn't matter if you're the, uh, the, the interim pastor of the church and the, the, the member of the congregation. It's not about whether I can serve you or not. It's we serve each other in humility. In other words, it's the lesser going to the greater. That's the example. It's huge in the life of the church. Now, let me throw you this one as well. When Jesus came to the disciples going one to one and to the next and to the next, when he came to Judas, Judas, if you read in the Apocrypha, it says that Jesus looked at Judas and said, I'm not washing your feet. You're a conspirating dog and I'm not doing it. And he skipped him. I made that up. That's not true. <laughs> Jesus washed Judas' feet. The traitor. Jesus knew. Jesus knew what he was going to do. The lesser or the greater going to the lesser. Talk about lesser. Conspirator, traitor. And he got down and he washed his feet. I guarantee you he looked up into, into Judas' eyes and said, Judas, wash your feet. Example of mercy and grace, even to the end. Aren't you thankful for the mercy and the grace of Jesus? 
even to the end, he's always reaching out, wanting, wanting, wanting to redeem us and to, to, to give us his grace and his mercy, even to the very end. Thank God for a loving Jesus. Talk about an example of humility. It's interesting if you notice and go back to verse 14 and 17. Let's see where it was. I'll come back to that. There was something else I want to say, but I'm going to come back to that. Here's the deal. How does Eric Schaefer have that kind of humility that I can serve someone like that? Hosea 6.6 6. Great text. It says, For I desire mercy rather than sacrifice, and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Now listen to that again. It's Hosea 6.6, 6, and it's God speaking through the prophet Hosea. And he says, Hosea 6.6, 6, I desire mercy rather than sacrifice, and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. What God was saying through the prophet Hosea, in that day in the life of Israel, all oh, they were going to church, the temple. They were worshiping. They were doing the burnt offerings and the sacrifices. They were going through all of the stuff. But God was looking out and he's going, Pewee! Pewee! You're going through the motions. Oh, you're burning the sacrifices and you're doing all the stuff and you're singing. But it's, it's a stench in my nostrils. You know why? Because he says, you have no mercy they, 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 were, they were killing each other and cheating each other and hating each other. And they were going through all the rituals of worship, but their hearts were bad. There was no humility. Their hearts were bad. And he was saying, I despise your worship. I'd rather you be merciful and have love for me. That's what he was saying. This is not about action. Jesus, with his demonstration, was not about the action of servitude, but it was about the attitude of the heart. Attitude of the heart. I was uh, at a training session with a group of men. We went together. And it was a, it was a, a church work training event. And during the course of that training event, we came to the swamp part. They said, we're going to have a foot washing. And um, I forget how it fit in. But they said, you need to pick somebody and wash their feet while you're here. One of the, in your group. Well, I sat back in my chair and I said, okay, whose feet do I want to wash in my group? There was a man in the group that I had some serious issues with. He had hurt me numerous times and caused problems, so on and so forth, so on and so forth. I didn't want to wash his feet. Let's be honest with you. But I sat there and I looked at him and I looked at his feet. And there's some bitterness in my heart. Didn't really want to be at that training session anyway. I looked at that individual and I said, you know what? If I really want to practice what Jesus was teaching here, I should be able to have the humility of, of my heart and my mind to wash his feet. But I didn't want to be a hypocrite. I tell you, man, I had a wrestling match with God right there. So I felt like God was saying, Eric, you need to do this. And he, I, I tell you, I was, I was struggling. And I did. I washed his feet. It was not easy. Attitude of the heart. How's your heart? How's your heart? The urgency of foot washing. The humility of foot washing. Lastly, I want to look at the blessings of foot washing. 
the blessings of foot washing. Look at verse 17, would you please? If you know these things, you are what? Blessed. Whoo, I love being blessed, don't you? I love being blessed. I want God to bless me just as much as he can, don't you? If you don't, there's something wrong with you. Here is a scripture that our Lord Jesus, a scripture of what he said, here recorded, that you are blessed if you do these things. Do what things? Humility. Humility, humility that affects a person's life. You'll be blessed. I want to be blessed. I got a phone call from my daughter um, this week. Interesting phone call. She called me up. She says, Dad, I need to ask you a question. My daughter doesn't call me a lot and ask me questions. I'm still a little bit mentally handicapped, you know. She gets a little older. I think I'll get better. But right now, I'm still kind of, kind of uh, slow. And she called me up and got my attention. She said, Dad, i got to ask you a question. I need some help on something. I said, okay, sweetheart, what you got? You all know my daughter. You've seen her. And she said, Dad, you know the church I go to? And she goes to a great church in Jackson, Mississippi. And uh, uh, that church is going and blowing. It's very much uh, oriented towards young people. It's, uh, music is very, very uh, upbeat. It'd be loud, a young preacher. I mean, it's, it's, it's bent for, towards reaching. She's involved in the dance program there. She teaches Sunday school there. She says, Dad, I don't know if this is the right thing to do or not, but, but a guy from our church was on staff. He left, and he started a church over in Jackson, in, in Jackson there, but he's over, and she said the name of the college. I don't remember what college it is. She goes, but he's, he's made a church that reaches out to the artistic people. It's an art college of some type, and it reaches out to the people in that, in that school. Now, the, here's the pictures you're going to see. These are the kind of people that, they are, that look like this that they're going to be ministering to. Go ahead and go through. This is, this is the kind of folks that she's going to be ministering to. And so, and interesting, leave that slide there. You probably can't read it. I had to really get my face down there and look, but it says, uh, it says listen to your soul. Did somebody read that from out there? Are you serious? Y'all can read that? Wow, I'm impressed. Listen to your soul. I thought that was interesting when I saw it. She says, Dad, uh, this, this staff guy, he's left, and, and he's, he's starting this church to reach the artistic young people at this college. And she said, and this was key, she said, Dad, I'm really, uh, it's, I'm uncomfortable because this is way out of my comfort level. I went, hoo, hoo, hoo. I said, Cool. And she goes, Dad, they, man, these folks, they got piercings and tattoos, and, and they do some weird stuff. And he says, or she says, but this, this, this minister from our church who's now opened his own church, and my next question was, well, is your pastor okay with this staff member leaving? Oh, yes, they're sponsoring the work. They're excited about this work because this church that she's in would never be able to reach these kind of folks. Never reach them. So she says, Dad, you know, the, uh, we've already had a couple of services. And she says, Dad, they're coming. He says, they're really coming. I said, well, tell me about the service. Well, it's loud, Dad. It's, it's a heavy, heavy band. I mean, it's, it's guitars and drums. It's really, really loud. It's different from anything I've ever seen. And, and the guy's a young preacher. And, and she described the service. And, and, and she goes, but they're coming. She goes, Dad, we had, listen, first Sunday, 250 of these folks in the worship service in an old redone movie theater. 250. I want to tell you, you don't reach these folks easy. Here's how they're doing it. They're going into coffee houses and they're going into tattoo parlors. <gasps> now, if my daughter comes home with a tattoo, I'm going to beat her. But they're going into those places, tattoo parlors, and, and they're going into places that you know we normally wouldn't in, you know, go to but they're getting those folks and they're touching them where they are. And now they're growing this church with these folks who, are, who would, are godless. So many of them are godless and they're now learning about Jesus and they have a desire to seek the spiritual. If you don't think so, look what it says on her, on her chest. And they're reaching them for Christ. Now you say, well, Eric, what's that have to do with humility? And what you, Here's the deal. My daughter said the key word, she says, Dad, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm uncomfortable. This is really way out of my comfort zone. Humility. Humility. I said, thank God. That my babies 
Serving Jesus thrills my soul. I'm going to talk to you really quickly about the principle of doing it to me. Doing it to me. Have you ever heard of this principle before? Principle, doing it to me. I asked my wife, I said, baby, I need a word for this. And I couldn't come up with a word. So I just had to call it the principle of doing it to me. Now, very quickly, I want you to go to Matthew chapter 25. Doing it to me. This is a principle for the church. Now, now hear me when I say this. This is critical. This is a principle that must be in the life of a church. If it's not, listen to me, if this principle is not in the life of the church, your church is waiting to have Ichabod written above the top of your door. Some of you are going, what's Ichabod mean? Ichabod means the spirit has departed from here. Now hear me. This is a, I, I struggle with whether I should say this, but you know what? As I've looked at this, I said, it's a principle the church's got to have. If it doesn't, Ichabod will be written on your church. Your doors will be boarded up or somebody else will come take your place. You say, Eric, that's a pretty bold statement. Well, let me read it to you, and then you decide what you think. Matthew 25, 34 through 40. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. The principle of doing it to me. If you look at verse 17 again. If you do these things, you are blessed if you do them. And then look at verse 20. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. It is the principle of doing it to me. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever seen a mama get mad when somebody does something mean to their kid? I'm going to tell you what. All you've got to do if you want my wife to rip your head off is do something to one of my kids in front of her. Now, when they were little, whoo, son, she's a wildcat. You mess with one of her kids and you don't have reason to, you're taking your life in your hands. You know what I mean? Because you know what that is? That's you do it to my kids, you're doing it to me. You know what I'm talking about, mamas, don't you? Now, I'm going to tell you about the men. Men, if you're like me, you do something to my wife, you've done it to me. But you do something to my wife or say something ugly to my wife, you're doing it to me. Gary, you better say amen to that. You sitting right beside you. It took him a while. I had to get that eye contact. The principle, uh, principle of doing it to me. In other words, when you exhibit humility to your brother or sister, you are blessing Jesus, and then Jesus blesses you. Humility. Humility. Humility, servanthood. If you do it to one another, you are doing it to Jesus. And Jesus blesses you. Now, well, Eric, what's that blessing look like? I can't tell you that. I know exactly what that blessing looks like. I don't know. I do know it brings peace and joy to your heart. He may give you material things. He may bless his church. We may start to grow like we've never seen. I don't know what that looks like. All I know is the scripture says here, Jesus says here, he will bless you. The principle of doing it to me. Now, I want to go to one more slide, and that's another foot washing that we've seen. And this time, instead of Jesus administering the foot, foot washing, it's being administered to him. You remember Mary, sister of Martha, the sister of Lazarus, who he rose, raised from the dead? 
Jesus was in Mary's house, sitting, reclining. Mary came up to his feet, slid up to his feet, got down while they were talking and work was going on. And she, she got down to his feet and, and anointed the feet with, with a fragrance, with a very costly perfume. And then she got her hair and wiped his feet, face, face, down to his feet, wiped his feet with her hair. Credible, credible demonstration of love for our Jesus. I love this picture. I looked and looked through the internet and thank God for Google images. And I looked and I looked and I looked and I found this painting of, of Mary hugging what would have been the dirty feet of our Jesus. What humility. I just thought that was an awesome Jesus used foot washing as an example of humility. Mary anointed his feet, wiped his feet in adoration and love. Can you imagine, church? Can you imagine if our hearts, we have a heart change and a mind change of humility that says, no matter what, I'm looking out for my brother and sister to my right. It's no longer about me. But it's about a humility and a love of giving up my rights and preferences and loving to the intensity that Mary exhibited here with Jesus. Could you imagine if that permeated to life of East Hill Baptist Church? Can you imagine that? If you'll put up 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23, and we're done. This was Paul speaking. Read along with me. This means I'm not bound to obey people just because they pay me. Yet I've become a servant of everyone so that I can bring them to Christ. Stop. Servant. If anybody understood humble servanthood, humility, it was Paul. When I am with the Jews, I become one of them so that I can bring them to Christ. When I am with those who follow the Jewish laws, I do the same even though I am not subject to the law so that I can bring them to Christ. When I'm with the Gentiles who do not have the Jewish law, I fit in with them as much as I can. In this way, I gain their confidence and bring them to Christ. But I do not discard the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. When I'm with those who are oppressed, I share their oppression so that I might bring them to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone so that I might bring them to Christ. I do all this to spread the good news, and in doing so, I enjoy its what? blessings. Humility permeated the life of Paul. James, it's not about you. That's what Paul would say. Not about you, Sidney. Not about you, Dad. Not about you, Paul. Not about you, Tom. It's about Jesus. It's about the person to your right and the person to your left. I need somebody to tell me it's not about me. Tell me, not Tom. It's not about Eric. You're right. It's about my family. And it's about my Jesus. And I've got to come with a humble servant heart and say, it's not about me. It's about you. And i got to give up my rights and my privileges and be the humble servant like our Jesus demonstrated. And if I'll get that in my heart, in my life where it should be, I'm going to tell you what. I'm going to be like Paul. I'm going to see people come to Christ and I'm going to connect with folks. If we become a church with this type of humility, I'm going to tell you what, folks. We'll see a dramatic change in the life of East Hill Baptist Church. And guess what? Every one of us is responsible. This is, this was the, nobody got past this. Not even you, Tony. Love you, buddy.